so on the other side of my life, I'm teaching medieval English legal history this term at 9.10 in the morning, and I must have set 9.10 just out of, you know, habit. But I have to say how happy I am to see all of you because, well, you actually did turn up at 9.10. Uh, and, and probably what that demonstrates is I should give up on medieval English legal history and do only free software law. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many friends. Thank you uh, for coming uh, in many cases such a long way. And um, I hope, as usual, that we are uh, providing a, a heap of intellectual value in return for the heap of time and trouble that you've taken to come and be with us. I, uh, I, I do think it would be relatively difficult, if not impossible, to be as optimistic uh, on this fine summer morning as uh, I usually am on the mornings when we all get together. It, being in the age of Trump and Brexit is a uh, load on everybody's mind and spirit, and not merely uh, because we worry about being extinguished um, in a sudden burst of rage, but also because we're in the freedom business one way or another, and it is not exactly uh, a perfect time in freedom. And so gathering comrades and near comrades and adversaries in this way uh, to talk about it is a little bit more weighty than usual. And I have that sense that I am, you know, personally lighter this morning because everybody's coming and I, I love seeing everybody so much and still not quite able to say by way of welcome that everything is just fine. Fortunately, although it's true that I'm not coming today to praise, I'm also not coming today to bury. Uh, we are not dead yet. It isn't over. Uh, but things are much tighter and much more difficult and much more acrimonious uh, in the world than they used to be. And they're going to stay that way for a while. And instead of being able to say that the answer is we could all just share the code and fix one another's bugs and scratch one another's itches and everything would be just fine, I am welcoming you to a working session in we have a bunch of stuff we really care about and we really love and collectively we called it freedom and we're trying not to lose it now, but it's a crisis time. When I was a kid going to school in the morning, I used to see walking along the margin of Central Park on Fifth Avenue uh, a writer I much admired named Lillian Hellman who was a, a great playwright and a great political pain in the neck and a deeply, profoundly important feminist, therefore, of course, a deeply, profoundly misunderstood feminist, um, who walked every morning by Central Park in her age, scowling like there was absolutely nothing in the world to be satisfied about. And as I am a great admirer of titles, like my dear friend Yochai, we steal one another's best titles from time to time, it seems to me. Um, I, I admire Lillian Hellman most for two words, for the volume of her memoirs concerning the McCarthy moment in America, which she entitled Scoundrel Time. And I have to admit that although I'm not planning to title my memoirs that way, this chapter of that moment in the work that I have done all my life would be reasonably so entitled. And we're going to have to deal with that, or we're not in the freedom business anymore. And although there are lots of people here whom I dearly love who are in the business business first and the freedom business second, I never gather with you without being grateful to you for all the effort and trouble and corporate money that you have put into the freedom business with me over the decades. We start our 13th year here. Maybe that's part of why I'm in an unluckiness mood. 
Uh, and we would not have done that. And the many friends I see around here who have worked for me and who have gone on to do wonderful other things in other places would not have had at least that stop on the train without you. I'm here, as I usually am, to say there's a lot of interesting stuff going on at the margins of what we do, and it would be great to get together for one day a year and look at those things and try and predict what comes next for us using those things at the margins of what we do. But it is also my business in welcoming this morning to say that part of what is at the margins of what we do is some real darkness at the edge of town. There's darkness at the edge of town because as Richard Stallman and I spent our adult lives trying to say to people who thought that we should learn to comb our hair or wear nicer clothing or whatever it was, I listened to you, he didn't. Uh, the, 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 the really important point here is that uh, if you don't have freedom in technology, then under the conditions of highly technologically developed society, you get slavery. Ten days ago in Beijing, the second most powerful and in that sense the most rational power wielder in the world made a 204 minute speech about the future of the new Chinese era and one of the things he said to which I was listening very carefully was censorship and the internet must be used to engage, resist and eliminate all erroneous viewpoints. I heard that very clearly. I mean, I, 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 right, I know what that is. That's a declaration of war on what we do. That's not me being anti-China. That's China being anti-us at a fundamental level. That's not, uh, I mean, you know, I, I used to have an adversary that was the largest, most deeply funded monopoly in the history of the world, and it is now grudgingly a friend, though not a donor, I, I feel it's important <laughs> to say. Um, and, and that was possible, okay? We could convert the deepest of our adversaries into recognizing that free software is a win-win proposition even for them. But I do not know how to tell that to the author of Xi Jinping Thought. I am a little concerned about the fact that what we have been doing all this time, and we're all in this room celebrating it, is make win-win solutions that were extraordinarily beneficial to A, profit-making business, B, communities of people who really wanted to do wonderful stuff, C, humanity. That was an excellent structure. I was well worth doing whatever plumbing I was doing and whatever fundraising I was doing and whatever speech-making I was doing in order to further that business. But we now have antagonists who are not going to be converted into friends. They're not going to be converted into cautious neutrals. They're going to go about their business trying to use the technology we love in order to extinguish human freedom. It isn't possible to do our work rationally or intelligently without acknowledging that. And so welcome is neither about praising ourselves for how well we did nor about burying ourselves. It's something in the middle. I hope what that is is a struggle to save the republic. I think there's an awful lot of struggling to save the republic going on. Sometimes, uh, well, uh, the resistance is a fine idea. But our idea originally was that we could resist the resistance, reduce the resistance in the circuitry, increase the flow, produce more freedom by putting freedom in everything and then turning it on. At the high water mark, we were really close. This is not the high water mark anymore. Now, that was the cheerful welcome that is preceding the cheerful keynote talk. Um, I met Yochai Bankler in 1994 when I came to visit and therefore to teach only temporarily at Harvard Law School. Yochai likes being at Harvard way more than I do and life has satisfied us both. Um, but, but the dissatisfaction comes from the fact that we don't inhabit Manhattan Island together anymore as we did uh, when he had left Steve Breyer and was a young law professor and uh, I was already, you know, losing the thread. Uh, we've spent an awful lot of time seeing the future together over the years. 
um, in Cambridge and in coffee shops in Lower Manhattan and here and in Israel and in other places, most of the conversations I've had over the years in which I felt that somebody had really snapped me up to see the future more clearly was one of those conversations with Yochai. Um, the way this works apparently now is by what is known in the trade as collusion. Uh, we don't see one another, we don't talk to one another, uh, we, we are traveling on absolutely different courses and I assure you that we're not corrupting one another's workers. Um, but, but I have the sense as we go through our lives together, and when I knew him he had not a gray hair in his beard and you know, I had only the first few because I was the, just then signing up to be Richard Stallman's general counsel, which is where all the rest of it came from. Um, my, my, my sense is that on those occasions when we have intersected, when we were in fact seeing the future, we tended, no matter how different the paths we had been traveling, still to be seeing the same one. And he and I were sitting out last night under the pleasant summer weather of early November on Manhattan Island and uh, deciding whether we see the same world again, and indeed we do, and um, this is why I feel motivated to give such an optimistic introduction for what is, after all, um, the view of the future I find myself closer and closer to. Um, we love and uh, uh, hate and carry ourselves, I think, very much uh, uh, in similar ways in life, though we do our work uh, rather differently. Um, he is, uh, in that sense, however, um, what the very meaning of comradeship is to me, and I hope that what he does with it will prove to you that you were right to come at 9.10 and you can leave by lunch because anything I say will be merely minor. That's the man. The, the titles that he gives his work, from the uh, wealth of networks to ones that I can't remember because if I try, I'll use the one I made up that he then took, um, are great. Um, Yochai's titles are a demonstration of the depth of thoughtfulness and ever-presence of humor, which is why he sees the future so well. The titles other people give him don't much interest me, but he is the Berkman and Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Studies at Harvard Law School and the director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and uh, institutions of such greatness and importance do deserve to have their due. Um, they, they embellish him about a thousandth as much as he deserves. Um, and it's my pleasure to the bottom of my heart and what little joy I have this morning to welcome Yochai Bankler. Uh, hi, Eben, thank you. Um, it's only when I come after you that I'm not the one who provides the grand historical thought uh, to, a, to a setting and a meeting. Um, are we projecting up there? We should in a moment. Um, what I want to try to do uh, and speak for 30 minutes and then we'll have a, a conversation is <clears throat> try to map out in uh, some detail what systems are involved in organizing the shape of flows of power in society <clears throat> with a strong emphasis on technical system, but not a sole emphasis on technical systems, um, and then try to map how it connects to this, this moment that Eben has, has um, um, set us up with. So going back to this old period of, of the 1990s, uh, there was one big monopolist and it held, held all the power and there was an idea you could have a free open source software um, operating system. How? 
the whole antitrust concept was you couldn't. You had to go after with law. Even after the leveraging into the uh, 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 browser uh, uh, space, antitrust broke it supposedly, did not develop until Mozilla got uh, the code and it turned around into a fundamental change in construction. And at the same time, you had serious engineers writing about the need to price packets. Otherwise, you would never get voice over IP unless and until, um, uh, um, uh, unless and until uh, uh, you actually change to ATM or some model of, of um, um, uh, packet pricing. So you had a fundamental set of serious people, serious lawyers, serious economists, serious engineers telling you, us, that the only way to structure things was around controlled, proprietary, uh, incentivized structures, which repeatedly failed. One of the reasons that they failed to predict the, uh, um, um, the actual set of events was the intersection of multiple systems of operation and power that shifted toward decentralization of power and openness and the capacity to actually operate. It starts with uh, the social cultural domain of how to do things, the net heads versus bell heads kind of framing. This translates into an organizational setting, anchored, of course, in free and open source software, but the Internet Engineering Task Force, no less in its anarchic model, um, and even the World Wide Web Consortium with its somewhat more bridging uh, relationship, implement in an organizational form a certain way of looking at the world. So you have a cultural system, you have a set of ideas, you have an organizational system, which then translate into a set of technical standards that themselves implement the same exact framework which at the time, because you're still mostly on copper wire, or if you initially transition to DSL, are still operating under a legal structure that is decentralized. Common carrier law, antitrust, and then moving towards unbundling and, and models of the commons. Um, um. And even the market, for all of the limitations of Windows relative to where Apple wanted it, was relatively open. Uh, and Chris Kelty has the beautiful chapter on the rise of openness as a, as a model. So what you get is these multiple high-level systems, social cultural structures and knowledge, organizational, technical, legal, and market, getting implemented in actual practical layers of the technical system such that there is no point at which, however many the engineers were who said we needed to move to packet pricing, it could be forced until Skype comes along. As long as there's one company, there's still the ability, once you actually build a community that's able to produce uh, for um, um, the operating system and the whole LAMP stack to develop. 2008, 2009 comes along, and suddenly we're in a world in which Apple can say Skype can only run on Wi-Fi because that's what AT&T wants. We can say Apple can block an app that's a game that shows um, um, uh, Foxconn uh, uh, production uh, workers jumping from windows. And critically, you see a series of changes that begin, and I'll describe them beginning in the technical area, uh, where the smartphone spills over into moving us into wireless into introducing iOS, into creating the App Store model, into creating cloud services. Critically here, the IETF doesn't need to change. TCP IP doesn't need to change. HTML doesn't need to change. It's above and below these systems that we have new control points that spill over into changing the, into changing the relevant market players, into limiting the range in which law saw itself as having an appropriate role, in creating a technical new layer uh, that's uh, with controlled APIs and DRM, in insulating the most liberating organizational forms of free and open source software and how it could actually play a role, and critically shifting the social cultural framework from one that was focused on openness and capacity to do for yourself to consumer uh, uh, to, consumer, uh, to consumer and user experience, 
to convenience, to attractiveness, to how much fun the thing is, um, as well as to investment incentives. Essentially, it's a resurgence of uh, the bellheads as you're looking at network management, as you're looking at uh, quality of service. Uh, and of course, this becomes the framework by which we suddenly see DRM being embedded as we move from the smartphones to internet of all, uh, uh, to IoT um, as the same model of being able to provide uh, one system, one company, universal service, as Theodore Vail said it many years ago. New companies, as I said, a new culture come in. So we then see the pricing models of uh, Facebook only. Uh, models from uh, wireless because, again, you're moving to companies that operate in a rhetorical space that allows them to take network management more seriously, that allows them to take limitations and capacity more seriously, irrespective of reality. Uh, we now see it in 5G and the effort to sort of, re of, of to proprietize uh, small cell architectures. Um, uh, we see this transition happening there. The next thing we see is that as high-speed home uh, broadband increases, uh, we see a range of additional devices coming in as the particular device uh, um, and moving all the way up uh, to video being becoming the major uh, issue. So what do we get? We get a more or less natural monopoly because of the cost of fiber deployment. We get PCs and video game streaming uh, devices and game cons consoles becoming uh, more critically, with Windows 10, we're getting the App Store model applied to many of the PCs. Um, and so between the rise of Apple, the rise of the smartphone, the emergence of the App Store model, even for uh, the PC, and the increasing dependence on video, we're seeing again a shift on all of these higher level systems to consumers as a focus, to the cable companies, um, uh, and, and industry negotiated standards, which is what we saw with uh, uh, DRM now uh, in HTML. Uh, we see it at the technical level, and we see the battle over net neutrality becoming the thing that uh, uh, is critical in the political sphere, even though we've seen all of the frameworks of reconcentration above and below it, uh, in many senses make it uh, last decade's mashed potatoes. Similarly, we see the move to cloud services uh, shifting to a social culturally to trust and security and convenience. Essentially, fear and convenience focused on passive consumers become the core organizing uh, um, um, uh, structure of how we think about how to build these systems. And by we, I mean not we in this room, but we in a broad market and regulatory society. The organizational structure at that point moves to be entirely internal to the providers. There is no public standard setting model. There, is no, there are no real interoperability standards. The standards are all proprietary. There's no real data portability. Um, uh, there are no legal requirements for interoperability and portability. Privacy uh, uh, largely is built on, on um, uh, ludicrous conceptions of consent and obsolete conceptions of anonymity, all of which still assume an autonomous, well-informed actor as opposed to an utterly dependent, ill-informed, and manipulated actor with no choice and no conception of the absence of choice, um, either at the individual level or at the population level. Um, and of course, we know the players in the market. So the story everybody tells already, it's a decade old, of all of the books Amazon could have pulled from the Kindle uh, because they believed they didn't have the rights. It had to be 1984 after all. Um, but it also goes to critical things like electronic health records. If you look at the market share of Epic, the leader in electronic health records, um, it is uh, the company that was built around, there's a beautiful RAND study on this, the company that was built around the fact that a member of the committee on the Obama administration's decision of how to push electronic health records, who said it's more important to incentivize hospitals to adopt electronic health records quickly than it is to insist that it be based on open standards and interoperability. That member of the committee went on to become the CEO of this company, 
which is now the dominant actor in electronic health records. And shockingly enough, as it turns out, its data are not interoperable, and it now has the advantage in all of the markets of the various uh, handhelds, not because of the operating system, not because of any of the utilities, because of the non-interoperability of data. Data becomes the new core infrastructure around which control develops, which is where the platforms come in. Essentially, we know these platforms and how they play out. We know the names. Um, critically, in terms of law, we've completely shifted from public law to privately created law, end user license agreements, and private ordering. We see repeatedly tippy markets with winner take all dynamics uh, creating the single platform um, and proprietary standards and internal organization. So that's the core. And we've seen this repeatedly across multiple um, uh, verticals. So in music, before the 1990s, we have the recording industry. We have the shock of Napster, Grokster, Pirate Bay in the 2000s with the development of voluntary payments, alternative payments, sonic bids, sort of a, a middle class of artists licensing and performing, shifting in the 2010s to platforms uh, like Spotify, YouTube, using Content ID. And you shift from the exhilaration around Amanda Palmer's uh, uh, proselytizing about artists gaining control of their relationships with their fans and making a living to Zoe Keating saying, why on earth do I have to sell everything to YouTube like I used to have to sell it to the labels? Um, if we look at news, we move from the traditional broadcast and newspaper cable model to the exhilaration with the network public spheres, with blogs, with writable web, with citizen journalists, what I call the network fourth estate in much too early an enthusiasm. Uh, this is the high water mark. This is, this, is a, this is the high water mark that Eben is talking about. And today we sit with a Facebook news feed. So what's an image of this? Before she thought, Look at all these amazing award-winning photos of uh, Chenaman Square Tank Man. They all come from the same place, the hotel where the journalists had to stay, because there was one source. And then we get to a point where Egyptian Tank Man is done on a little video that's in someone's hand, and where the entire political debate over police shooting of black men is transformed by the capacity of anyone to grab something and say, I am making today's news. And it doesn't make more, take more than three years before Facebook can take Corinne Gaines off uh, because of a request from the police, and suddenly we have a reconcentration. Fundamentally, what we have is a reconcentration of power without a reconcentration of production. If Eben pushed resist the resistance in 1999, increase the flow, the move that has happened is that the flow still flows, and the players understand how to shape and manipulate the flow in order to achieve precisely the results they wanted to get through resistance. And that was, I think, our big miss. Mine, certainly. The ability to manipulate flow as a critical dimension of power, rather than the ability to create the gateway to control uh, 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 the content itself. And of course, Facebook has now become the uh, epicenter of the epistemic crisis in which we find ourselves. Um, then you move on to production, um, and, and you see the shift from managerial capitalism to neoliberalism characterizing the first uh, uh, 90 years of the 20th century. We see this brief interregnum of the possibility of an alternative model most expressed in free and open source software, and now we're seeing the move to Uber or on-demand economy, et cetera. So the critical thing that happens across all of these is the combination of the rise of big data and the capacity to leverage data to uh, um, uh, um, control everything, and the intellectual move in the behavioral sciences to understand fully the behavior of people and to experiment on a large scale to manipulate such that you get at the population level a small set of players able to manipulate large populations 
to achieve changes in behaviors, attitudes, outcomes, and configurations on a scale that we've never seen uh, before. So we see in the shift from Charlie Chaplin to, to uh, Asimov's uh, um, uh, Q1, uh, data becomes the critical input for machine learning and AI and becomes the critical infrastructure around which control of physical processes is now going to develop. We see platforms extending the model that already developed since the 1970s and 80s of the networked organization, supply chain management, outsourcing, instead of the single uh, firm. But data now becomes an infrastructure for all of these platforms controlling reputation and trust, controlling supp uh, supply uh, and demand, and critically developing experimentally informed, behaviorally managed monopsony and monopoly pricing in both the labor and services markets. And so the entire economy is structured around this control over data translated experimentally into extracting value from anyone around you. And in some sense, the most profound challenge to the possibility of a liberal democratic uh, society is the capacity to leverage rich individualized data and behavioral marketing to inform finer grade manipulation of preferences and essentially make what we already knew to be the case for all of economics um, uh, complete and, and, and scientifically uh, refined. So uh, one image to look at this is from a study I just finished with uh, 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 a team uh, at, at, uh, 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 at my center, uh, looking at two million stories over the course of the election and how they were shared on various models. And you can see this is based on, on uh, the size of the nodes is based on how often uh, they were shared on, on Facebook. What you see is that tone, tools honed for behavioral marketing are transposed into a network propaganda machine with profound disruption to the very possibility of a shared anchor of truth and we see the emergence of these capabilities in state actors. We see them learned in communities of far-right uh, extremist activists that are distributed. We see it as a product of sheer solution in the so-called fake news clickbait Macedonian teenager kind of sheer uh, effort to just make uh, um, money from uh, advertising. But I think fundamentally what we see it is in this capacity of campaigns and highly mobilized illiberal parties to leverage, uh, uh, the, to leverage the models. And this quote from Bannon, Facebook is what propelled Breitbart to a massive audience. We know its power. That's why I'm going with the Trump campaign only when I know they have Facebook, is to understand that this model of fine-grained, detailed understanding of people and manipulation of behavior is a fundamental challenge both to our democracy and to our capacity to have a reasonably uh, uh, functioning economic system that is not highly controlled. There's no exit. These are the only platforms. Voice is episodic, diffuse, and manipulable. Uh, regulation is now evaded. We saw this in gray ball with uh, Uber and the capacity to predict who the regulators are in Dodge. We saw it in the VW emissions uh, scandal. Uh, there's just uh, uh, route, seeing regulation uh, uh, and routing around it, uh, in a sense. Um, we're essentially seeing the incumbent platforms create new dimensions of power vis-a-vis -vis individuals, both consumers and citizens, and workers and sellers in terms of imposing discipline and extracting rents, and vis-a-vis -vis competitors, both competitors for the platform and competitors on the platform to be able to extract their value. One point that is something that we need to sort of take a deep breath on, um, uh, and that's what happened with video. Uh, spot the one that controls a Linux box. But there was a certain conception of being able to build freedom into infrastructure such that choice didn't enter into it. Freedom was there by design. And yet, 
There's the thing we use for uh, working video on a Linux box, and where is the freedom in that? I think that's a real challenge we need to understand for ourselves. Um, Neil Postman wrote, amusing ourselves to death about uh, TV, uh, but, um, but uh, uh, Cory Doctorow put it uh, just earlier this year, we're hux huxling ourselves into the full Orwell. And I think that's fundamentally what's happening. So I want to stop, so I'll just at a very high level ignore the slides I'm, I'm skipping through. I just want to identify a couple of things at a high level and then bring it to a close. Critically, I think we need, as we're thinking, particularly in this room of people who think particularly about building freedom into technology, to understand that technology interacts with ideology and with institutions to shape power over economy, polity, kinship, and culture systems, that we have moves to, con to extract power and influence. Think of it as rents in markets, influencing the magnitude, the defensibility, and bargaining power over them, that these are played across these dimensions of technology, institutions, and ideology, and that's the details of what I was trying to put in front of you earlier today, that there are feedback loops that as one thing changes, the others do too, and make it easier for the next round uh, to win. And we see periods of punctuated equilibrium. And I'd say 20 years ago, we thought that the internet shocked the system. Very quickly, I'll just say, that if you look at 46 to 70, you have technologies around author an authority-based ideological framework translated into authority-based organizational models. With neoliberalism, you see choice in free markets and technologies that enable radical uh, uh, opening of markets translated into deregulation and privatization. What we saw in this period around the emergence of the internet was this idea of network pragmatism, as I'm now trying to see whether we can call it, of the need for continuous exploration, experimentation, and learning as the only way to deal with the full fallibility and unknowability of the way the world works, translated into institutional battles over the commons and over property, over all openness, and over closed structures. And what we see today with the new technologies is really a battle between four core ideological frameworks, the techno-libertarian, the, and the network pragmatists that emerged in the 1990s. The economic nationalism that we're seeing with Trump developing as a model of controlled recreation of control. And this idea of nudge progressivism, of the ability to build a, um, a good government based on better data uh, that controls, that nonetheless can either become part of a legitimating framework for techno-libertarianism that doesn't have uh, uh, an ability to actually distribute power, or uh, something that is more focused on our ability to learn our lives together. So certainly there are discrete types of rules we can go for. We need to look at open architecture. We need to look at transparency and accountability. We need privacy regulation more as environmental regulation rather than as a, a notice and consent type model. And we need extremely aggressive enforcement against manipulations of preferences and opinions because we cannot depend on choice under conditions where we know that choice is the object of scientifically informed manipulation on mass scales. We have to have continued focus on techno-social resistance, so there's a whole class of people doing platform co-ops and the effort to build cooperatives, but fundamentally the freedom box model of actually trying to re-decentralize, to bring decentralized structures secure by default as alternative infrastructures so as to at least create the possibility space. It still might lose because people choose otherwise, but create the possibility space for a genuinely open um, um, uh, uh, and liberatory framework. But the fundamental challenge is to re-embed economic production in the social and to strengthen the power of political and social norm setting over the logic of the market. And that can't be done with technology alone. So that's the um, less optimistic version uh, of the story. I'm not sure which of us was less optimistic uh, but I think it is incumbent on us, particularly people in this room 
who reasonably, and I think reasonably, believed 15, certainly 20 years ago, that this was an inflection point where freedom could actually be built into the system and then let people run, to understand that that moment failed, that it is not over, but that in order to win, it has to be integrated into a cultural and scientific and political and normative campaign and cannot be solved with technology all the way down. You see why I miss the coffee shops. It's easier when there's all afternoon. But we live on time. So um, I won't begin. Questions should be everywhere. Mine are old hat to him. Um, if you're going to ask a question, uh, please do, as uh, Sean O'Brien is doing, uh, press the button first so our stream listeners can hear you. Great. Um, so wonderful presentation. Um, very interesting stuff. It strikes at the heart of what we try to talk about in crypto workshops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that goes along with privacy and, and this idea that we had to kind of give up on the high watermark, right? One of the things that goes along with that was the web of trust and those kinds of trust models. Um, where do you see that going? I know there are some people trying to reinvigorate that as well. And is that something we can kind of salvage? So uh, there's the technical question and there's the practical question. Um, to the best of my understanding, I have many people much more uh, uh, expert than I on the technical side of the question. The answer is yes, uh, right? In principle, you can. Uh, you certainly see people uh, trying to do it in different variations. Obviously, most of the public conversations now are around blockchain, but that's not uh, necessarily the be all and end all. Uh, but there's a the technical question is, in some sense, yes. The practical question is this barrier that we saw with the adoption of platforms, which is bridging the sensibilities of people who know enough to care and know enough to be technically um, 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 focused and not to really think of the degree to which somebody who is not focused on the technology, not aware of the freedom implications, just does it because it's the easiest thing to do. If you look at the things that really um, uh, have worked, they've either been fully implemented at the, at the technical back end, like Linux, or they've been just the best thing around, like Wikipedia, and most people who use it don't even know. Uh, and, and that's the, in some sense, that's the consciousness uh, shifting need for those who do work on those technical infrastructures. That is to say, a critical design requirement is, if it's to become a population level intervention, is that people want to adopt it who haven't the foggiest idea what they're adopting for, other than it's the cool new thing, or it does this cool new thing for me, and I don't have to think about it. And I think that was missing in the first generation of, of um, um, transmission. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, <laughs> years back, uh, Jabber was pretty popular. Uh, Google had a big Jabber client. Um, uh, uh, Facebook's Messenger is still based on Jabber, although at this point it, it has so much proprietary garbage on top it's unrecognizable. Um, Google moved away from Jabber, uh, and, and we used to have this uh, open source, decentralized, uh, free network for messaging, and now messaging is becoming this proprietary mess that's just terrible. Um, how do you think that figures into the whole uh, equation? Um, it's a new kind of, um, think of it as a new kind of adversary, uh, right? It was one thing to actually intervene vis-a-vis -a, -vis a set of incumbents 
who were relatively clueless and were just trying to see how this thing could be shoved back into the box that was. It's very different when you're in a context of playing against players who understand every bit as much where the battle is and who are fighting the battle everywhere. So whether it's by buying companies, whether it's by embracing something and, 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 and then turning it off in certain ways and making it um, um, uh, more controlled, uh, that's the strategy. Now, you can't depend on a single thing succeeding. Friendster thought it was re doing really well, and in 84, 85, you would not have thought Facebook over MySpace. And yet, there it is. So, so this, the other thing that's critical is the need for continuous sensing and updating of what it is that is or isn't catching, how it is catching, and what needs to be uh, revived. But fundamentally, the problem is that you have a class of incumbents now who are moving every bit as quickly, if not faster, than the free software development community. And you need, in some sense, to find things that are extremely easy and wildfire, and wild, uh, uh, fire adoption that won't then be purchased by one of the no-exit players. So uh, let's say that um, uh, what happens is that we see this future, and you go to do a really hard job, which is to teach it to the economists. And I go to do a really easy job, which is to simplify it to the point at which we could actually you know, do something. And I caused the problem. I mean, I, I don't know how good you were at teaching it to the economists either. The high watermark there was that a woman won the Nobel Prize in economics. It happened exactly once. And she was Eleanor Ostrom, and she was our comrade. Uh, and for a moment, that was the great economic thinking in the world for exactly one year. And Ellie didn't even live to spend the prize money. Um, and now, well, it's the behavioral experts in the industry that has finally figured out that human nature is important. Um, I see Yochai as I think he, on, on the days when he doesn't have to be modest about it, he sees himself in the line from Adam Smith to Thorsten Veblen, and they don't succeed in teaching economists anything until there's a sort of hundred year lag time, and on Veblen we're still waiting. Um, the, 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 so one thing that happened was uh, we oversimplified. Uh, I, the, the future that we saw together, uh, we oversimplified because we thought if we could just get everybody to understand free software, it would work. And what you've said is, yeah, at, at one layer, but they surrounded you, and, and you're in a battle of being smothered now. Uh, and that's fine. I mean, that is where we are. We'd better accept it. Uh, we oversimplified. And now the complexity of the situation catches us because we meet our own strategies and our own ideas coming back uh, all around us, and we sit in the iron ring at Cannae, and we don't know how to get out. One thing that is for sure clear about this is that um, you're not going to do it by doubling down on the oversimplifications. Uh, one of the lessons that I take from Yochai's way of thinking about it for what we do now down in the oversimplifier world is we stop oversimplifying quite so much. Um, th th that, that requires us uh, to stop thinking that our real problem is we're not just following the rules of free software as well as we should. Uh, that's a kind of religious response to the nature of the social challenge, right? We, we just think it's the problem is that we weren't virtuous enough. And if we could just be a little more virtuous, we could fix it. And the important thing about this analysis is to demonstrate why that's not true. Uh, that's, that's the first thing I take from this. You, you think I'm getting it right? So, so the next step that follows from that uh, is that although we have to continue to press our claim on infrastructure, right? The work that I have been doing with clients over the last five, six years over future internet architectures to make sure that there was GPL v3 code at the center of all next generation internet architectures is failing. 
It's failing because the first five years of NSF funding has been replaced by the need for semi-commercialized funding, which dropped all my clients into the 5G Syriana that you were talking about. Everything is connected because everybody now knows how much connection is worth. And instead of being about telecommunications infrastructure to get packets to free people, it's about measuring everybody who used to be free people by collecting all their packets and figuring out who they are. So now we have a situation in which our attempt to get copyleft into next generation internet architecture, A, fails, and B, wouldn't have been good enough anyway, but we have to keep doing it. The Freedom Box idea, Yochai didn't give the disclaimer that he sits on the board of directors of the Freedom Box Foundation with me. I should give that disclaimer so you know that that was propaganda and manipulation. Um, the, the Freedom Box idea, that is to say what we now need to do is to take that free software and package it and merchandise it at price zero above the cost of the cheapest SBCs on earth in order to give people ways to have servers because if you don't have servers, then the people are serving you, and everybody serving you owns you, and that's the way it is. Okay, we have to do that. And after seven years of doing that, I'm getting to the point where I really see that, that the project will work, and that there we can do this, and every cheap SBC on Earth can be turned into something which, John knows, if I use a, an open PGP key is a person model for communications, allows me to use the web of trust to set the trust in the infrastructure of the network. That's all great. It's terrific. We know it's not going to succeed. That's the other thing about this analysis, right? It tells us, OK, we can push freedom into the infrastructure the way we always meant to do. We can keep playing the beauty of our traditional strategy, make freedom, put freedom in everything, turn freedom on, and it won't work. There's still a reason for doing it, which is that it might work, what Yochai called having a space of possibility, right? This is all we mean. We could use this free infrastructure and this free software as a teaching tool so people don't absolutely forget that there is a space of possibility. They only relatively forget it because it's not convenient enough. And convenience rules. That was the third thing, right? That what we have done is to let people face the fact that you get freedom if you struggle for it. And you don't get freedom if you don't struggle for it. And struggling for freedom is not convenient. The last thing that Yochai said was, and don't think you're going to be able to teach that lesson easily because propaganda now rules. Because big data society can work in one of two ways. The people who live there can be free people or they can be slaves. Because if you can be manipulated as easily as the all-knowing system that only cares for collecting all your behavior can manipulate you, then what freedom do you have? This, of course, is a conversation we are having in the big United States this moment because a man who ought to know better says that we had a civil war because we couldn't compromise. Which is wrong. We had many compromises. We compromised about slavery in the United States every single decade between 1790 and 1860. The thing is that each of those so-called compromises has one inherent difficulty, which is nobody asked the slaves. To say that you're compromising about slavery without having asked the slaves is, of course, to say you're not compromising about slavery at all. You're just strengthening it. Now, I recognize that most people will consider American chattel slavery to be far more problematic than using unfree software on computers. The beauty of Richard Stallman, the reason for my lifelong comradeship with Richard Stallman is that he couldn't tell the difference. And that was really important, that there was some human being who couldn't tell the difference, because that told us that ultimately we were going to have to face the question. So we simplified it in order to get as far as we could with it. But it won't work. Am I right? Uh, <laughs> uh, it depends on what you mean by won't work. OK, good. Um, I think what we've seen 
is that technology and technological structures can, uh, again, create affordances and constraint. They can create boundaries on the possible. They can't determine them. And so uh, um, when you say it won't work, I would just say it won't work by itself. It's a necessary precondition. Um, and even necessary is strong, right? It's a matter of load balancing, right? You can have, if you look at, um, if you look at the PC and the spreadsheet and its relationship to the financial industry. Uh, so financial industry, you get changes in financial theory going from the 60s, 70s uh, that uh, uh, develop all of the underlying theory behind options, behind collateralized debt obligations. None of that gets implemented until 82, 83 with the LBO and CDO uh, explosion uh, because it's just not capable of being trans translated into practice. It doesn't change the fact that when you look at the graph of the relationship between uh, wages, relative wages in the financial industry and um, 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 relative education, the same exact uh, uh, alignment occurs when you compare it to deregulation in that space. So this, this idea of financial deregulation and changes in financial deregulation, changes in ideas about shareholder value in companies um, and changes in technology all align up to create this model, but it didn't happen in other countries. Right? So even in that context, the technological capability was there, but it required an integration with the regulatory framework. You could in principle imagine, you could in principle imagine an absence of a freedom enabling uh, technological architecture with enough political power and enough normative, social normative pressure on everybody from the engineers to the, to the CEO working in these companies that could constrain the uses. It just puts a very high load on systems we have seen failing before, which is to say politics and social norms. It's very easy to get people in positions of power to believe in the correctness of viewpoints that legitimize their making money from their position of power. It is much harder to persuade them to have a noblesse oblige model of actually sharing that power and enabling freedom. By contrast, if you're able to build a technological platform that actually allows people to migrate and makes it a little harder to impose control over people and makes it a little easier for people to resist that control, you're load balancing away from pushing very hard and you're creating a constituency of people who can then push on the political side push on the normative and social norm side uh, and, and move things along. So, so it's critical as a component of load balancing between these systems to achieve freedom. Uh, and in that regard, it's um, critical, though it's not clear that it's either necessary or sufficient. I think I can still get up tomorrow morning. <laughs> but here's what I'll have to do in order to get up tomorrow morning if you're right about that. Right? Because what I thought I was doing all this time was trying to make win-win solutions in the one layer that really mattered. And therefore, if we could find a way to convince people that sharing in a fashion which respected every user's freedom was also going to create a win for them in their business at that layer, then we could take care of everything that mattered and we could do it without having to shoot anybody or redistribute anything. Which, as I said in a free Berlin standing in the Congress of the Peoples and the Alexanderplatz in 2004, meant that I thought we could get ourselves out of Isaiah Berlin's trap and we wouldn't have to adopt romantic utopianism and then we wouldn't find ourselves in a subsistence crisis and lose our revolution at the guillotine that we actually had a better way to do it. Proof of concept plus running code, and then we could have a revolution in the layer that mattered. And now I'm load balancing, and everybody here knows that once you've got this orchestration layer and all this traffic management, the, the simplicity is out the door, and, 
you're going to get owned somewhere by somebody, and the proposition is by the no-exit parties, and that's the crisis. And now it's not enough to have a win-win solution at the layer of the infrastructure where we could figure out how everybody could make money and everybody could make money respecting people's freedom and we'd be fine. Uh, two things happened beyond what you said, one of which was that all the manufacturing capacity drifted into a political environment in which respecting users' freedom might not be a neutral concept. As long as you're making money, it's okay. It might not be okay even if you're making a ton of money. And the second thing that happened was that we drifted away from making win-win solutions. The same thing happened to us that began to happen to uh, corporations that lost their grip. We got a little happy on the idea that we could use our rights in a you know, leveraged way to keep the thing going. And that turns out to be impossible. I, that's not necessary and it's not sufficient. In fact, it's the reverse of both. So here we are, we're still going to try to make win-win solutions at the layer we used to think was crucial. And you tell me, yeah, that'd be good, it might even help. It's not clear that you're getting anywhere because all those other layers have to be balanced off against it. And of course, we can't do that by just making good software. It's a social challenge to us because our society, the one we made, the one our comrades made with us, the one that we have been loving all this time was based around the idea that the merit of the code would ultimately drive the outcome. All we had to do was make it better and make it free and we would win. You say, yeah, well, that's a good idea. Why don't you try that? But please keep in mind that there's a whole bunch of other things going on that could wipe you out in a millisecond and they're really much tougher than you are and unlike the last time you dealt with people who are much tougher than you were, they're also just as smart at least as good. Right. So we have to architect a third dimension now. All that load balancing stuff, we have to learn how to work that in a win-win way for us. And we can't do that by just writing good code and we can't do that by just sharing that code virtuously. That's great, maybe even really helpful, totally not going to do the job all by itself. And what is the other stuff by itself? Now, if you tell me that that's antitrust enforcement, I have two things to tell you, right? One, in some really important places, it isn't going to happen. And in the places where it is going to happen, it's going to happen in an excruciatingly complex, expensive, time-consuming way that in the end will settle for all the wrong things when they finally get around to settling it because they can't afford to do it anymore. And at that layer, we can't load balance. I work very nicely with the lawyers around the world in Brussels and Washington and other such places who do that work, but I can't load balance with them. There's no win-win solution there. All there is is an endless number of Brussels and Luxembourg meetings and litigations and money going down the drain like it was going out of style. And a lot of guys, you know, with expensive law practices, I'd neither want to join nor be seen with. The, the, the outcome of that doesn't look too good to me. If that's the layer in which we have to win, although there are people in this room who work for entities who could carry that fight for us, yeah, I didn't think you were going to volunteer, Mr. Wright. I, that, that was kind of how I saw it. Um, and, and that's a real problem, right? We had, at the high watermark, capitalism was eating out of our hand or we were eating out of theirs, but either way it was working very well and everybody was getting free lunch. Now it's not like that. I take it. Moreover, the no-exit parties, they go to the United States Senate and they lie there, what's a call it's off, about how they participated in this democratic triumph we are having in the United States and there's nobody to say them nay because they are the no exit parties and where would you say them nay except on their platforms somebody turned off real Donald Trump yesterday for 14 seconds or 12 11 minutes, minutes. 11 minutes. 11 yeah, minutes. And, 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 and that was more work than we got done in the free software movement all year long <laughs> now, now, now that's really not good for us so how are we going to do this <laughs> uh, All right, great. Let's let somebody else tell us. Anyhow, let me ask you this question. Uh, given this backdrop that's going on in Congress, attacking, well, questioning these no exit platforms, how should they and other platforms when. Oh, thank you. How can, how can these platforms, whether they're the no-exit platforms or others, respond to 
you'll excuse the, this characterization, the gullibility of the general population to being swayed by things when it's really not the platforms, it's the content, and do we want them to be the gatekeepers? But I'm more concerned with what happens to the development of technology if, if, if they're allowed to, to go to what I think is their end goal, being Congress. I, I don't know if, if I made that clear or not, but... Uh, I'll try, and you'll tell me whether, whether yes, I sir. understood or not. Thank you. Um, I understood your question to be about how we reshape the practices of the no-exit platforms, uh, given the observations we have about how, uh, what a role they played. One thing you said was, it wasn't them, it was the content, and I want to push back on that, because uh, at a, so we have, largely speaking, four potential um, uh, culprits in the major disinformation campaigns. We have Russia, we have the far right, we have the fake news Macedonian teenagers, and we have the Bannon-Mercer Trump universe. It's critically important to understand that explicitly, Facebook played a central role in the Bannon-Mercer Trump story. We know this from stories from inside the campaign. We know it from Bannon describing it, that Facebook directly worked with them on taking the things that they developed for marketing toothpaste to marketing Trump and the exhilaration. I mean, the irony of this is Facebook is sitting up there and saying, oh, we got 126 million uh, impressions. That's marketing. They're marketing to other political advertisers that they're really good in the guise of disclosing what happened that was bad. So it's just important to understand what we witnessed this week was a massive marketing campaign for the efficacy of Facebook advertising and the ability to manipulate populations so that everybody with all of the billions of dollars of worth that go into uh, 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 political advertising shift from TV to Facebook. That's the 100,000 with the millions of impressions is the same thing. You can get a lot more impact. So how we change that, and this goes also back to this question of um, how do you not get depressed? You, don't, you get not depressed by looking at gay rights. Right? You look at a context in which 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Things that would have been inconceivable, like, say, gay marriage, become reality, not from antitrust or law operating, but from law catching up to where society is. So the moment of opportunity we face, and by we here it might be within the high-end knowledge production of academia, it may be within the broader popular culture, is the sheer epistemic crisis that is exhibited, not by everyone. There's a portion of the population that's perfectly happy to accept this, but there's a substantial anxiety both here and in Europe uh, in particular. Uh, and that moment of trying to really locate blame where it belongs, understand, not dodge, and understand that what you have here is a fundamental assault on the possibility of liberal democracies and liberal market democracies, uh, such that it becomes as inconceivable for a Facebook CEO or a Facebook engineer to design freedom-destroying technologies as it is to implement uh, gender and sex-based discrimination well beyond what law is. It needs to be shameful rather than or only illegal. And then it can also be made illegal relatively easily. The problem is that people do shameful stuff all the time because it's so convenient. That the thing was that it was not, there was nobody who could convince you that it was convenient not to be allowed to marry the person that you love. But there are lots of people who can convince you that it's totally convenient to surrender everything that makes your life independent of the controllers to the controllers. That's a really easy lift, comparatively speaking. 
which is why I'm not absolutely positive that I can use any illustration that doesn't also contain that core problem of the absolute seductive evil of convenience. We have to figure out what we want to do about that. And we're going to have to do that in a way which is going to allow us to attach our very large values to other people's micro decisions about what's convenient for them. And that's a tricky problem. The good news is we're out of time, so you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, the bad news is that if you want to hear my answer to that question, you have to hang around until the end of the afternoon. But I do think it's the crucial question, and I don't think it would be fair to send you away by telling you, this is a really hard question. Uh, we just don't know how to answer it. There are two kinds of law professors in this comradeship. There's the one who can use the phrase sheer epistemic crisis, and there's the kind who can't, and I can't. So if you will hang around to the end of the afternoon, I promise you not only that I will attempt to answer this insoluble conundrum, but that I will do so without the sheer epistemic crisis. Thank you so much, my dear man.